All right, it's time to get into the word of the Lord. And this is Christmas, so guess what I'm going to be speaking about. Uh, And um, I hope that you are really getting stirred up with a prophetic word and the inspiration of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in your life, in your home, um, and in this season. For me, it's the best time of the year. And today's message is called The King of Kings. And I want you to open your Bible with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 1. And we're going to be looking at several scriptures here and there. But starting off in Luke chapter 1. And we're going to read the visit of the angel to Mary. So Luke chapter 1 verse 26. Luke 1, 26. This is what it says. In the sixth month, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, to a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words. Would you be troubled if the Lord came to you and said, well, an angel appeared and said, greetings, you are highly favored. The Lord is with you. It's kind of like, okay, what do you want, right? (laughs) Well, Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God and you will be with child and give birth to a son. You are to give him the name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. His kingdom will never end. And then we go down to verse 52. Luke 1, 52, when Mary goes and visits Elizabeth just a day after, and Mary starts to prophesy. And in the middle of her prophesy, we read verse 52. He, that is God, has brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we say yes to the move of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of heaven, the Spirit of Jesus. We thank you for your Son, and that he came to this earth as a baby, and that he was destined to be the Savior of the world and the ruler of the world. We thank you for his government. We thank you that he is King of Kings, and we receive your blessings now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. So there are seven places in the Bible that says that Jesus is King of Kings, Lord of Lords, God over all so-called gods. This is not just one place in the Bible, uh, but he is King of Kings. This is more than you might think. What does it mean when we say that Jesus, this baby who is being born in a manger, being laid in a manger... Uh, What do we mean when we say this one is king of kings? There are three different things that I've discovered in the scripture that tell us about what it means when it says that he is king of kings. First of all, in Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5, we read there about him being king of kings, and it tells us one of the reasons why. So Revelation chapter 1 and verse 5 says, And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So the reason why he is king of kings is because he is the king of all the kings. He is the ruler of the kings of the world. So whether we have a president, or there's a queen in England, or there is a, a, 
a prime minister in Israel, wherever there is somebody who is a ruler of a nation, whether they know it or not, he is their king. He is the king of the kings. He is the king of every political system, although he is not in, in uh, direct uh, administration over them. One day he will be. You know, one day uh, he will be the king of the whole world and every nation will be under him and every leader of every nation, every mayor of every city will see Jesus as the king of the mayors and the king of the lords and the king of the presidents and the king of the prime ministers. He is the king of the queens. He is the king of kings. So the first thing that we see when we say, who is this? Who is this baby? He's the king of kings, and it means that he's the king. He has all authority and all power. He's the king of kings. Now the second one we find in Revelation chapter 17 and verse 14. So Revelation 17, we read about him being king of kings again. And in verse 14, this is what we read. They will make war against the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Can you say a little louder? Jesus. Yeah, they will make war against the Lamb, Jesus. But the Lamb will overcome them because He is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. So when we say that He is King of Kings, there's a second understanding in it. It means that he has the power. Yeah, he is the king of kings, because, not just because he is being assigned, but he, when the devil comes, and when the nations of this world, when the battle of Armageddon comes, and they want to hold a war against this ruler named Jesus, they will soon discover that he is king of kings, and he will overcome them, and overpower them, and win every battle, because he is king of kings, he has all power, he has all authority. Hallelujah. Now the third thing we find about him being king of kings is found in 2 Timothy, excuse me, 1 Timothy, chapter 6 and verse 12. And it says this, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of eternal life to which you were called. Paul is speaking to Timothy, and he's saying, fight the good fight of faith. And in verse 15, we read this. God will bring about in his own time, God the blessed, the only ruler, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, who alone is immortal, and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see. I want you to know that he is king of kings because he deserves to be. And the reason is because he is personal. There is no king like this king. There is no pontiff or leader of a nation who if you are a citizen of that nation will take a personal interest in you. And not only a personal interest in you, but a, person, a personal interest in everybody else, in every other person in the realm. He is king of kings because he's your king. He is king of kings because he's personal to watch over you. There's no king like this king. There's no one who can be in a political place of authority who will t take such priority to hear from you, to listen to you, to uh, call you to himself, to fellowship with you, to walk with you, to answer your problems, to answer your prayers, to solve your problems. In fact, I want us to put all of these three things together now. He is king of kings because he is king over all the other kings. He is king of kings because he has all power and authority. And he is king of kings because there's no one like him. He deserves to be king of kings because he's your personal king of kings. He comes to meet where you are. This is so powerful because he's the warrior king of heaven. 
And when he comes to fight on your behalf, there is no power that can stand against you. There is no prayer that cannot be answered. There is no hardship or difficulty or roadblock that cannot be bust out of the way because he is coming riding on a white horse and he strikes down evil. And he does it not just when he comes again, but he does it in your life. He watches over you. He is your personal king of kings, the Lord Almighty. It's no wonder that the angels sang and rejoiced and the heavens split wide and the glory of the Lord descended in three-part harmony because the king of kings is coming. Hallelujah. So do you understand when he is called the savior of the world that it's not just that he comes to take your sins away, but he comes to fight on your behalf. He comes to be your king. He comes to clear the way. There's no stick of dynamite, no hand grenade, no atom bomb that can clear the way before you like the power of the Holy Spirit and the coming of the King of Kings into your family, into your life, into your situation. He is the Lord God Almighty, the God over all gods, the Lord over all lords. He is the King of Kings for you. Hallelujah. Give him a clap. Tell him you love him. When we go into the book of Isaiah, we read about this in finer detail. Because there in chapter 9, starting in verse 6, Isaiah 9 verse 6, we find a prophetic word about the coming of this babe in the manger. And it reads like this. For to us... A child is born. To us, a son is given. And the government, say the government. The government will be on his shoulders. Isn't that a good thing? It doesn't have to be on your shoulders anymore. There's one that you can go to. The Bible says, cast your cares upon him, for he cares for you. The government is on his shoulders. Your cares are on his shoulders. We're taught in the scripture that he daily makes intercession for you. He daily prays for you. He is called the apostle and the great high priest of our confession. If you will confess him, he will be your high priest. He will represent you before the throne of God Almighty. He will be there to say, I want you to know about my Daughter, my son, I want you to know about their family. And there, all the angels are gathered around. He is before the Lord God Almighty, and he is your high priest. We read on in Isaiah chapter 9. It says, starting in verse 6, For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. Do you understand when the scripture says that the government will be on his shoulders? That means the government of the world. But it also means the government of your family. It also means the government of your life and the government of this nation. The government will ultimately rest on his shoulders. Now there are wicked people in this world and there are nations that are corrupt. But your family doesn't have to be that way. The reason why nations are corrupt is because they've tried to take the government off of Jesus' shoulders and put it on themselves, and they mess it up every time. The reason why we have problems in every business, in schools, is because the government is taken, it's usurped. It's taken from the shoulders of Jesus and put on themselves. And if your family's a mess, it's because somewhere in your family, 
whether somebody or the whole family or the leaders of that family have taken the government that belongs to Jesus and usurped it and put it on themselves and try to run their program their own way and every time it is inferior, it falls short of the glory of God and comes into disaster. And the answer for every home and for every individual, for every business, for every school, for every country is to put the government back on the shoulders of Jesus and say, Lord, according to your way, and your way, he's the savior of the world. He is the babe that the whole of heaven rejoiced when he came to this planet. He is the king of kings. He has all authority. He is the king over all the kings. And he's your personal king of kings. Who can stand against you if you have the king of kings that you serve and he's the one who's calling the shots. You know, I've had a lot of people attack me in my life. I guess it comes with the task of being a pastor. They go home for lunch and they have pasta for lunch. <laughs> with or without red sauce. Yeah. You know the problem with the church is discord and disunity. It can be a thing of gossip. It can be a thing where people do what is right in their own eyes. And as a result, when people start to backbite each other or talk against each other, demon powers have a right to attack. Do you understand that if there was peace in the valley and perfect love and nobody spoke ill of anybody else, the devil would not have a place to enter your family or this church. But when somebody tears down another member, now, everybody's worthy of being tore down because nobody's perfect and everybody's going to make mistakes. There's no doubt about that. It's not a matter of being perfect. It's a matter of does your tongue need healing? And if your tongue needs healing and you heal your tongue and you only bless and don't curse, if you only speak well and don't criticize, then the devil, he can't get in. But as soon as you criticize, demons are just waiting. Well, look, here's one of the sons of the king. Here's one of the daughters of the king and they are taking a pot shot at some other Christian, therefore, we now have authority to take some pot shots too. And that's the roadway that the devil has to get into people's lives. If we're a kingdom church, we're a family. And in this family, we speak well of each other. We bless one another. Yeah. So when the government of God is in your family, you're going to be happy. I didn't say you weren't going to have tribulations or difficulties, but be of good cheer, for he has overcome the world, and you are under his covering. The government will be upon his shoulders. This is the personal anointing of the warrior king of heaven in your life and in your family. And it says of the increase of that government, here in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, that there won't be an end to the increase of his government. And then it goes on to say that over his kingdom, he will establish it and he will uplift it with justice and righteousness. So this is what the Lord's going to do. If you walk with the Lord and let him have his place as the government king of kings, how many would say here, Jesus is my king? Let me see your hand. Hold it up high. Yeah, he is my king. Now that doesn't mean that he is like another king, where he's just king over a nation, so you call him that. It actually means he's the one calling the shots in your life. He's the one giving direction in your life. He's the one who's, who's putting the, the pathway for you to walk in 
And whatever you do, you do it unto him and because of him and for him and in response to him leading in your life. Then he is really king of kings in your life. And when that happens, there will be a residual blessing that comes over your life that is unstoppable. You know why? Because he is king of kings and lord of lords. Yeah. Don't fight for yourself. Let him fight. Because he's... He cannot be defeated. He wins in every situation. And he will establish you. You see that? His government is to establish. And he will uphold you. Some of you might be under attack right now in some way or another. The worst kind of attacks that I've found are relational ones. When somebody is speaking ill of you criticizing you, tearing you down, especially if it's somebody that you're close to, that you have a connection with. And that's where the biggest pains are. Those are the things that are hardest for you. But when Jesus is king of kings and you make him that, he will uphold you. He will establish you. That's what he does in his government. That this government is not just an ethereal kind of thing. It's not a mythical thing. It's a very real thing. He will have your back. He says, vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. He will cover you even when the whole world comes against you. He will watch over you and protect you. He will be your shield and your buckler. He will be your strong tower. He will be your defense. He will. If you walk humbly, like Mary said, she says he brings down rulers and he lifts up the humble. So the rulers of darkness that come against you, Jesus is king of kings and lord of lords to tear them down. If you walk before him, if you make him your government, if you make him the king of kings, this babe in the manger, if he is the one who is lord of lords over your life, Then, watch out, devil. I feel sorry for everybody who attacks me. Thank you. (laughs) I feel sorry for everyone who attacks me. I'm only going to bless them back. I want you to know that. If you say something bad to me, I'm going to say something nice to you. If you say something two times bad to me, I'm going to say something nice about you three times. But I feel sorry for you because I'm not going to attack, but I have one who is king of kings and lord of lords. And he says, touch not the Lord's anointed. And this isn't just for me. This is for every single one of you. If you let him be the king of kings in your life, Watch out, devil. Yeah. And I've seen it again and again. I, I wince when I, when I hear about somebody attacking. Because I think, oh, Jesus, please be merciful to them. Do you understand what I'm talking about? I don't have to fight this battle. I have to ask that God will go easy on them. I do. I'm very serious about this. Because he is my king of kings and my lord of lords. I can't help but prosper. You should know that. I can't help but be successful. I don't mean in every inch along the way. But I mean at the end of the season, the glory of the Lord will be proven again in my life. It's because he is king of kings and lord of lords. And he fights my battles. And there's no one who can stand against him. He is the one who I look to, and he is the overcomer of every, every power of darkness. This is for you too. This is for your family. Are you with me? So we see at the end of this Isaiah scripture, Isaiah 9, we come to the end of that verse that we're reading and it says that he over his kingdom establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness he will see to it 
that justice is brought to you and righteousness will flow like a river, like a river of gold in your life. The righteousness of God doesn't just make you good, it makes you feel good. I feel good. Da, 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 da. So good. I feel fine. Why? Because I'm not standing in this world by myself. I'm not alone. In fact, I don't have just a big brother. <laughs> I have the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, the Savior. Of, he is my Savior. And the saving power is that he wins my battle. He doesn't just save me. He wins my battles. Not one, not two, but all of them. So that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And that's your inheritance. See, you have been brought into the great family of God. You are family with him. You are his daughter. You are his princess. You are his son. You are his prince. Just make sure that the government's on his shoulders and not on your own. You put the government on your own shoulders, you're going to get worn out. You're going to make a lot of mistakes. And it's going to go bad. But if it's on him, you're depending on him. You're looking to him because the government's on his shoulders. He will establish you, he will uphold you, and he will bring justice and righteousness into your realm, into your family, into your life, into your world. Hallelujah. Do you know that you are called his inheritance? Now, he's our inheritance. We will inherit all things with Christ. But the Bible says that we are his inheritance. Everything he did to make this world, every angel he sent here, the investment of the blood of his own son was spent for a specific purpose that he might have a reward and you are that reward. He didn't do it for the trees or the lakes. He didn't do it for the fish, the tigers, or the horses. He did it for you. You are his inheritance. And he is our king of kings. And he will establish everything that needs to be taken care of. So he will push down evil around us. It will be there, but he'll push it down. And he'll lift up and exalt. I want to take us to one last portion of scripture. We'll stay there a little while. But it's in Luke again, chapter 2. And we did this study with Asher and I. Did you enjoy the preacher Asher? Wasn't he amazing? Well, we talked about Simeon. And it says that Simeon, verse 28, this is Luke 2 took Jesus in his arms and he praised God. In verse 30 he says, well, verse 29, halfway through, it says that he could be dismissed now because, verse 30, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which is Jesus, a light for Gentiles, a light of revelation for the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel. And then Simeon prophesies over baby Jesus. In verse 34, it says, Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child, this new baby Jesus, is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed. So Jesus coming is to reveal your heart and to cause some people to rise and some people to fall. Well, immediately our thoughts gravitate towards the falling and the revealing of the hearts means it's an exposing of evil. 
But I want to talk to you from a different perspective. Because he's not just coming for the falling of many in Israel, but for the rising of many in Israel. And he's not just coming to reveal the evil in people's heart, but he's come to reveal the good that is in people's heart too. And if he is your king of kings and lord of lords, there's something that he wants to do with your heart. He wants to realize, he wants you to realize, and he wants to reveal the Christ inside of you, the goodness inside of you. He has come for the rising of your life. If he is king of kings in your life, don't think about the falling and don't think about the evil, but think about who you really are. See, when people get beat up and they get pushed down and they get attacked, sometimes the frustration that's there make them feel as though they're, they're just in the mud and they don't feel very good about themselves and they begin to self-condemn and they begin to, to put down the word of faith. I'm so glad that you're doing proclamations and prayers and prophetic words and pancakes. Yeah, and you see, what you have to find out is who you really are. I don't mean who you were, but I mean who you really are. And who, you, there's an old song that I really don't like. It's a hymn of the church. And it says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's a horrible thing. That verse should be ripped out of every, every hymn book. Yeah. The, the song is, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, which is a good song except for that. Because my heart's not prone to wander. My, my heart's prone to go after God. That's what's really inside of me. How many of you want to be like Jesus more than anything else? How many of you want to serve him effectively? Just hold your hand up, because you're not going to be able to put down your hand for a while. Now, how many of you want the shining light of Jesus in your life? How many of you want Jesus in your family? How many of you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit? How many of you want to see miracles flowing in your life? How many of you want to pray prayers that hit the target? See, that's what's inside of you. That's who you really are. That's what you really want. All the other stuff is when you get tripped and kicked and pushed down and, and you make errors in your choices because of other factors that are coming in on you and you choose wrongly. But that's not who you really are. Now you are the children of God, the sons of God. And it doesn't yet appear what you shall be, but one thing's for sure, that when he comes again, you will be like him, for you will see him as he is. So when Jesus comes to reveal the hearts of many, he's come to reveal who you are, a son, a prince, a queen, a princess, a daughter of God. And he's here for the rising of many in Israel. How are you going to do that? How are you going to see that? You're going to make him king of kings and lord of lords in this season. At this time, Jesus is king of kings in my life. Watch out, devil. Though the whole world be against me, it's okay. Now, the whole world isn't against me. I have lots and lots of friends who love me. Some of them are in this church. That's that's true, but the other truth is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many demons are frothing at the mouth, how many evil men would want to take me down, how many politicians would like to have an antichrist agenda over the United States of America. I want you to know something. Jesus has the final word. And he is my personal king of kings. And I cannot be moved. I'm a tree planted by the rivers of living water that brings forth its fruit in due season. It cannot be stopped. My leaf doesn't wither. And this tree's not drying up because I have the king of kings in my life, over my life. And the government is on his shoulders. It's not in D.C. The government is not in Russia. The government is not 
in London, England. The government is on his shoulders in my life. And one day, it will be over the whole earth. Like the waters cover the sea, it will be everywhere. Unto us, a child is born. Oh my goodness. Unto us, a son is given. Like no child, like no son. And the government, what government? The government for my life. The government ultimately for this nation. The government for my family. The government of this whole world is on his shoulders. And he will establish it and hold it up and bring righteousness and justice. And Jesus came so that that could be revealed in you. And you could rise to your destiny and to your fullness as a king's kid. So this is Christmas. I hope you can invent a new Christmas dance. Turn the lights off so that even you can't see. Get out by the Christmas tree with a hallelujah time and start to just say, Lord, I am so excited. Salvation's just the beginning. It just brought me in the door. But Lord, you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords over my life. Therefore, I cannot be moved because you cannot be moved. Hallelujah. So I want to read a closing verse in Revelation that we've already talked about. And it's Revelation 19. It's a picture of Jesus' second coming. Revelation 19 and verse 11. I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice, he judges and makes war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head he has many crowns. And he has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. This is Jesus. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. King of kings and Lord of lords. Do you understand he's not just nice? Jesus doesn't simply come with good intentions. He comes to make war. He comes to make war against your enemies. He comes to make war against those who would attack you. Because he is king of kings and lord of lords. And he is your king of kings. He's the savior of the world. Would you stand to your feet? Some of you need to do some business with the Lord. Where you proclaim his lordship over your life. And the fact that he is the king of kings over your life, personally. And some of you have been dragged into the mud. You got caught in the weeds. Because you don't know. You forgot that he's king of kings and lord of lords. So let's pray right now.
and rededicate our lives unto him and put ourselves in the right place where we put the government of our lives back on his shoulders. So hold your hands up, please, and pray this prayer like a powerful preacher. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for saving me. I confess I need you, that I cannot do this by myself. But I thank you that you are my Savior. You are my Lord. You are the King of Kings. I put the government of my life on your shoulders for my future and my family and my finances and my health. I cast it all on you. And King of Kings, I ask you to be the warrior king of heaven on my behalf and bring the victory so that in every place I will be an overcomer because you overcame and will overcome. I stand in your strength today and receive your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask the ministry team to come up and if you would like more prayer, you come and let them minister to you. Some of you need the cobwebs blown away. The fire of God to be reignited, to stir up the gift of God, to fan into flames the gift of God that's within you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Put your hand on your heart. Let me bless you. And so it is Christmas. Why shouldn't you be blessed? For God is your Father, so give Him the rest. And give Him your best. Now in the name of Jesus, I just stand with you today for all of God's goodness and power on your life. For you to know the strength and the anointing of the King of Kings watching over you and your family. Ha! To lead you and to guide you and to bring about all his goodness for you. I break off every judgment against you, every evil attack. In the name of Jesus, I break its power and I speak life and strength to you the favor of God on your life and on your marriage and on your children and your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. I speak in agreement with heaven for the river of God to come from under the throne of the King of Kings and to come all over you and your family. I speak his favor over you, the unstoppable glory of God. I speak it over your life. Joy in your heart and peace in your home and the providence of the Lord's hand in everything you touch. I speak it over you now in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and Merry Christmas.